Hey, just real quick, if you didn't know, my book Rebels Creed is now available on audiobook. Look at it, it's gorgeous. So you can listen to Michael Kramer and Kate Redding narrate my book if you would like to. Let's go ahead and get into the episode. This place is great, you know? It's whimsical and fun. What are you looking at, mother The Wheel of Time, episode tres, is one that I think has the best angle to it and the worst of the three we have gotten so far. But let's go ahead and start our walkthrough with Nineveh and Land, because this is kind of the most straightforward of the plots to talk about. We essentially see the picking up of Nynaeve, where she did survive Winter's Night, and I am a big fan of this sequence, where we see her just desperately scrambling to get away from a trollic. There's a nice dragon's fang, who? We get this shot where it looks like Zoe Robbins is straight up out of Apocalypse Now. And a lot more shiving. This show has more shiving than I expected it to. <laughs> and then we flash forward to where she is meeting with Lan, and they have some banter back and forth, and this is pretty much exactly how their relationship is presented in the books. Zoe Robbins does actually try and kill Lan, it seems, and he easily disarms her because... He's the greatest human swordsman of fantasy, arguably. And then knocks her unconscious. I also want to point out, I really like Lan doing textbook disarming techniques during this, where he slowly stands up to his feet, maintaining eye contact, so she will maintain eye contact with him. Gets her used to his hand raising up slowly for gesturing, and then he smoothly takes away the sword, all getting closer to that moment while keeping her at ease. It just shows a lot of training and experience from the guy, and I think it was a nice subtle addition where he's just going, look in my eyes. Don't look at my hand. I'm maintaining eye contact. Prolonged eye contact. Look here. Yeah, my hand's moving, but I'm just gesturing. Don't worry. Bam! We then have Nynaeve wake up and agree to help Moraine recover because she kind of has to. And with some more banter between her and Land, we kind of get her established to be folded within the party. She is now agreeing to go with them because she's hoping it'll eventually lead them to her friends that are lost into the world. And this plotline nice and smoothly concludes with us actually coming into a party of Aes Sedai who have Loghain captured. More on that to come. I assume. I will say, this show is just full of such striking-looking people. They just found, like, a consistency of just very well-defined faces, and it actually gives me the impression of, like, this is far in our future, where we have evolved in some ways. That, yeah, our bone structure's different. There's ages coming past. I don't know. That's just my weird interpretation. But I found this plotline to be perfectly fine. It is definitely setting up a lot more in the future, and doing so with some good comedic moments. I especially like the chemistry between Zoe Robbins and Daniel Henney, and getting to see Nynaeve actually practice her wisdom's craft is quite nice. It's not all just the one power. Other people are useful too. Good on ya. But now let's get into the plot line I am most conflicted on, because it is our Marcus Rutherford's Perrin and Egwene Alvere, aka Madeline Madden. Now their performances are absolutely fine throughout, and I actually do enjoy a lot of the smaller moments of them really taking care of each other, but the wolf presence felt kind of odd here, and the introduction to the Tinkers as well, I just wasn't the biggest fan of. It was presented oddly, I didn't like the way it was shot, and the costuming was strange. So while there was not really a lot of deviation from the book, actually, except we're not getting one key character uh, yet, I don't know if he is to come or not, there's just a lot of, like, okay, here we are now. And the change of Perrin possibly having feelings for Egwene, especially with them fridging his wife, just not a big fan of this. It's it's a very strange thing to put in here. I don't think will pay off well for the characters. And if it's just used for cheap drama later on that's just swept under the rug eventually, I'm going to be mad. It's essentially setting up future episodes and putting them in a position where they will get to where they need to go. But I just wasn't very drawn in by it. And I really think having... Some other characters come into play here, which that were in the book would have made this much more enjoyable. That being said, I get why they're not, because it would be a very big time commitment, and this episode is already pretty chock full. There's a man sawing something outside. Yay. Now, the guy with the saw is gone, but I did realize I forgot to mention the fact that the vibe with the dream world and how they're incorporating that without getting into spoilers is very strange to me. I don't know if I like it or not. I'm going to have to see more examples of the dream world and its inclusion to the story. I am happy as a fan to see it's here. It's just kind of this weird mixture of 
overly done and underly done in some ways. I'm not sure. I, I just need to see it more. So the Lineve land side of things, I'm feeling a solid seven. It's fine. Unfortunately, the Perrin Egwene one, now that I've even rewatched it, just because it's so just not eventful for me and doesn't really do enough to enhance characters or keep something going. I'm actually feeling a kind of just average five. It was shot well, scores nice, but I'm not really getting much outside of that. I need more here. Thankfully, though, we then cut to the strongest plot line of the series so far, this little story of Matt and Rand surviving in a town, and wow, was this done extremely well. Not only because we have Rand and Matt just having the best chemistry between each other. From the beginning where Rand is calling out trying to find friends and Matt is essentially convincing him like, stop, we're probably gonna die if they do that. I don't know if you noticed, but there's like, you know, armies of Trollocs. And we even have the progression of a little arc for Rand where he was originally wanting to go home, but now that Egoyne is in danger and they've had their little bit of makeup, he's like, no, we, we need to go find her. I'm very attached. And Matt, understandably at this point, with everything being scattered and essentially him only staying with the party because he wanted to get the Trollocs away from his sisters, the Trollocs are away now, he's like, let's go home. So now we actually have a nice reverse, but they do end up continuing on. And the justification of Rand convincing Matt through saying, if we go back, the Trollocs will, and it will not be home without our friends is just, that's a way to motivate Matt. Well done on your manipulation, Rand. <laughs> and a joke that almost took me out of the show, but was so successfully delivered that I didn't mind at all is the play on the phrase, all roads lead to Rome, but being applied to the White Tower. And then Barty Harris goes, that's not how roads work. <laughs> that was, this guy's got a future in comedy. I hope he's doing well and can get back into acting. And once they moved on a bit, we even see some of the iconic banter between them and the books delivered here in the show as they arrive at this town. And it's just, it feels like Rand and Matt to me. And I'm so happy and excited to see that on the screen. But they enter this tavern and we get our introduction of Tom. And I said this on Twitter and I stand by it. This is a better introduction of Tom than we get in the books. Let me explain in my subjective opinion. There are a lot of characters already introduced in episode one and having Tom in there as well would have just added to an already crowded bunch. In the book, Tom shows up and is fun and fine, but here we actually have Tom walking in, singing, delivering a really great performance and seeing these destitute kids and immediately wanting to take them under his wing. And that still matches up with the motivations of Tom extremely well. And it makes just as big an impact. So for the show, it was a better introduction of Tom. I'm not saying I would rewrite the book to have it this way. I wouldn't change Eye of the World, except for maybe the ending, because it is what it is and it's a classic. But here for the show, I think this was a spot on choice to make. But once they enter the town, Rand and Matt have a nice little bit of banter with Tom, where a purse gets stolen and restolen, donation for the Gleaveman, and there's also an Aiel hung up in dead in town, which is hearkening to something into the book as well, from a very different scene, but it's still being reincorporated and used for world building and showing just the desperation of Matt, who, after some time and clashing heads with Rand, uh, acting a bit not himself, you might say, he's deciding he needs to hire a book to get home. So he's going to go try and loot this dead body, and Tom catches him doing this and is like, look, get you're in a bad situation, I'll let you do it but you gotta at least help me bury the body, which Matt does. And it's actually a really good way to establish some form of connection between these two characters. Tom is already imposing some form of code for Matt to follow, and that's just, yes, he's, he's taking on that mentor role. But this is a very poor mining town, and Rand, in the meantime, is talking with an innkeeper who seems to be wanting to get out of there and is describing just how desolate and desperate a place like this can be and how she's just tired of living in here. And Rand is talking about how she could leave and they're actually having a good amount of bonding. There's even one line where she's like, you know, you and Matt can get loud if you want to. And Rand's like, hey, I'm not really into Matt in that way, but it is what it is. And Barty even earlier has a really great line where he <laughs> he's like, do you think she'd be down to 
have a threesome. But this innkeeper starts to give off a little bit of an odd vibe with how much she's clearly trying to get close to Rand. And a move is made, and one of the most, oh shit, lines I've actually seen in a while was dropped, where she says, was my braid too much like hers? Or something like that that's referencing Egwene, which immediately told me, oh, dark friend, shit. I could tell something was up with her from before that reveal, but for some reason my brain was going, she's gonna be an agent for the Red Aja. It actually wasn't a dark friend I was suspecting. I was like, you're gonna do something bad, but oh, you're the worst. And the reason she's brought Rand into this room is because it's essentially a prison and she has summoned a Fade to come and take them. It was at this moment Jackson knew. He f and this performance by this dark friend whose name eludes me was actually really captivating. Uh, there's a bit of a chase sequence after Rand clearly displays some form of crazy power as he busts down this door that she's like, hey, three men couldn't take that down. And Rand's just like... <laughs> and she begins chasing him with his own sword. They run into Matt, and I love this moment where Rand's just like, run, and Matt's like, what? Oh shit, and <laughs> just starts going with him. It was really funny to me. And if you just freeze frame at any given moment while they're running, I love the two expressions on Rand and Matt's face. There's just a woman with a sword chasing them, and both of them are like, what the fuck? But they get cornered because they don't know this town, and obviously this person who grew up and lived here would know some shortcuts, so she's able to get ahead and corner them, and then we get a monologue, which explains how someone could join the Shadow. The Shadow exploits desperation, depression, a lack of self-respect, envy, and these are the things that have driven this woman to agree with the Dark One's philosophy that reality should be shattered, destroyed, done away with. And it's kind of this intense scene where you're not sure what Rand and Matt are gonna do. We know these two aren't killers. They can't just murder this woman. Plus, she has a sword, and so there's this giant. Oh, there's a fucking knife in her neck. Oh well. She's dead now. She dead. And this is another thing the show is doing consistently, where they'll understand a character extremely well. Like having Tom just kill a dark friend for our boys is something he would absolutely do, because he's smart enough to know these country kids aren't gonna have the guts to do it. So he's just offhandedly willing to do that. But Earlier, having Tom take from Matt, yes, he's stealing from someone who stole from Matt, but he doesn't give it back until far later on. It's not clear if he would have done that anyway without Matt helping him. And that felt wrong to me. Tom would never take from people who are so clearly so down bad, and it was a straight up mean thing to do. That kid could now starve on the road because you took his purse. Tom wouldn't do that. And so this whole sequence to me just was what I've been looking for in this show. We get really good character building and work, references to the books, an introduction of another character in a way that I actually think is satisfactory for the show, a introduction to the concept of dark friends and not just making the mustache twirling evil, but justifying how they could end up joining the shadow, interesting fun action sequences, references to greater powers to come, and Tom murdering a dark friend because of course he would this guy has had a dark past not to get into spoilers and he's a bit jaded with the world so this just is it this is the kind of stuff i'm really looking for and so overall this episode i'm actually going to say i'm at an because fortunately this is what the episode focuses on really heavily though i will note the other plot lines were just kind of fine it felt a little imbalanced and i don't love it but i'm really happy that i can just go back and skip the parts that weren't necessarily interesting to me and enjoy this brilliant representation of the story of the wheel of time through some of my favorite characters of all time. I'm checking to see if the Tom song is on Spotify. Uh, it's not. You right to jail. But let me know what you thought of this episode of the Wheel of Time show in the comments down below. Like and subscribe if you have not already and look forward to more episode deep dives coming in the future. Have a good one, y'all. Peace.